No questions. So 1 Thessalonians, take your Bibles, go to 1 Thessalonians. Uh, 1 Thessalonians is an interesting book. Let's pray. Well, Father, thank you for your blessings tonight. Thank you for just letting us come to church. Uh, Lord, thank you for a church at, uh, a building that you've given us to in heat. And, and uh, Lord, just everything you've given us, Lord, what a blessing that is. Uh, Lord, help us never take it for granted what you've given us. Uh, Lord, and always uh, be thankful and prayerful about what you give. Lord, we got a prayer meeting tonight. We always do on a Wednesday night. Lord, help us to uh, use that, Lord, uh, for the few moments that we get here as a body of believers to pray together. But, Lord, as we depart with each other, that we don't forget these prayers that we bring up and that we pray all week for people, Lord. Uh, in these times, Lord, that we're in right now, that's something that is really, really needed. And Lord, again, I, tell, I ask you, pray, bless us tonight, bless those watching, and we'll praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. On the uh, sound, uh, is there any way y'all can check the sound before... Because uh, the last couple of weeks, the sound hasn't been getting out. All right, good. we got to figure out. I had it set up in the uh, uh, nursery, uh, but the nursery workers all sitting there going, yee, yee, yee. So, uh, you, yeah, I've seen that. You need to go make sure that there's only X amount of nursery workers working. Uh, uh, ladies don't belong in the nursery unless you're a nursery worker. Nothing personal. Don't get all upset. I mean, we don't need the church in the nursery. So anyways, uh, 1 Thessalonians. Uh, 1 Thessalonians is, is actually uh, is a strange book in your Bible. Uh, you would not think it. You got your Bible, starts with Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Then it goes to uh, Acts, Romans, and 1 2 Corinthians, 1 2, uh, 1 2 Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, 1 Thessalonians. And you would think, you would think that in people look at the book, you know uh, Thessalonians was the first book written in your Bible outside of Matthew. So in the New Testament. So Matthew was written around 37 AD. That's where they give it. Uh, some of these guys try to put it out there someplace, but Matthew actually was written uh, early. We're going to believe it, just leave it there. But Thessalonians, 1 Thessalonians was written uh, around 50 AD, somewhere between, uh, Dr. Roman gives it 46, 47. Uh, Schofield gives it 52, something like it, 50, 52, something like that. So I'm going to just stick with, with 1 Thessalonians 52, 50, 52 time frame. Uh, all the rest of your books in your Bible were written after that. John, Luke, uh, uh, Matthew was written early, Mark. Uh, Revelation, Revelation was the last book written. You got John, 1 John, or uh, the Gospel of John written about 85 to 90, somewhere in that time frame. Then you had 1st, uh, 2nd, uh, 3rd John written uh, 92 to 96. Then you had the book of Revelation written. So the really, Dr. Roman always, always said, he said that a thousand times, that the Thessalonians, everybody always gets them to read John first. John's a great book. Uh, there's nothing wrong with the Gospel of John, but John was written in 90 AD. Somewhere out there, 85, 86, 87 AD, John had the ability to have all the stuff that you and I, most Christians will never understand when you get started off. A baby Christian doesn't understand all that stuff. Uh, they don't understand Moses. I've talked to people and said, do you not understand uh, the, uh, yeah, you all know Noah's Ark. Yeah, I know Noah's Ark. Yeah, it's a nursery scheme, and, and they have it in the nursery and little animals and everything getting on the ark. Uh, they didn't say that, you know, billions of people could have died right there and flooded out and killed, and eight people got on the ark. That's, that's kind of a sadistic thing to put. But when you tell them about the things that Moses did, you ever read a book of Leviticus? I'm telling you what, man. I mean, if you read Leviticus and you've seen what you, if you lived back there, what you had to do, to get to heaven, you'd be thanking God for Galatians and Romans. I mean, you'd be thanking God. I mean, I, I look out there and say, Lord, I tell him, I'll tell him, I say, look, you can fire me, shoot me, get me out of here anytime you want to get me out of here. I'm still going to do what I'm supposed to do the best I can. Until you do that, I'm a mess. And I just read through your Bible. You know what's wrong with most people? You never read your Bible. So since you don't read your Bible, you don't understand how messed up you actually are. And in the sight of God, I mean, we're talking about God. Almighty God, we're, we're messed up. And he gave us something that was free, didn't cost you a dime. It was mercy and grace, and it gets you off into eternity, and you don't burn like a, a piece of toast, man. You just don't. Uh, every time I go and put toast in a toaster, I turn it all the way up because I like it toasty. And Beth keeps saying it's, it's hell, man. My toaster is set for hell. And it, my toast comes out black. Uh, but you'll never burn up. In hell, you never burn up, man. First Thessalonians. First Thessalonians is the first book in the New Testament. You said that. Uh, uh, that a new babe in Christ should read. Go to first, first Peter real quick. First Peter, just a couple. We'll, we'll get a couple verses here and there and, and try to get through. Man, it's a great book, man. Your whole Bible's. you ought to want to read your Bible. I mean, you really ought to. 
And the problem most people don't is because you're, you're living in sin and you want to stay in sin. But if that's what you want to do, that's fine. I mean, it's not my job to uh, uh, police everybody, get behind them, get them out of sin. Uh, the will of God's easy to find if you want it. It's easy to find. You know what you do? You wake up today and you do what the Lord tells you to do today. And then he'll start throwing little red flags up. Little red flags are the greatest thing I've ever seen in my life. Because all of a sudden through the scriptures you'll read them and flags will start flying. And you go, what is that? Think that the human to know the will of God is not as easy as you might think. Uh, our flesh gets involved in that. Like I told everybody, I, I went to school, there was 44 guys. Got behind a pulpit just like this in class. I'm sure Joe's class did the same thing. Got behind a pulpit in class, all 44, 100% said the will of God for my life is to come to Bible Baptist Church, uh, PBI, and go to Bible college for three years. By the end of three years, 33 of those suckers were gone. And I couldn't tell you where they are today at all. You know what that tells me? Number one, they did not know what the will of God was, and they said it. Or they're not doing the will of God. I mean, you don't, I don't think you... You embark on something like going to Bible college and make, make that thing a joke. It's not a joke. It never was a joke. Uh, but some people do that, and, and 33 of them in my class did it. So what that I learned right there is, and then I watched people over the years, the will of God is, and then it never comes to pass. But our flesh gets in there, and brethren, you know what we want? We want, we, I don't know of anybody who doesn't want to be smack dab in the middle of the will of God. But to be in the will of God, man, it, it costs you. It costs. And, and you got to have a relationship. And that's why Dr. Robin always talks about relationship. Great thing, man. So 1 Peter, 1 Peter chapter 2. It's great, great passage. Peter's a good brother. Verse 2, uh, uh, verse 1. Wherefore, laying aside all malice. Now, here, you want to you wanna really get to down some things. Peter got it down, man. He had some of this. And James and John, all of them, I, I can imagine them all having it together. Wherefore, laying aside all malice, and all guile, and hypocrisies, and envyings, and all evil speaking, as newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word, that ye may grow thereby, if so be that ye have tasted that the Lord is gracious. The Lord's gracious. I don't know about you, but he, you're talking about gracious? 43 years into this thing, and I started looking. I'm 66. I'll be 67 this year, but 43 years in this thing. I cannot believe he's as gracious and merciful as he is. Most of us are just ignorant because we don't really know what he's doing. And we're nowhere near, so he just leaves us alone. And one of these days, the judgment seat of Christ will pop up. Uh, it'll, it'll, by the way, uh, Brother Anderson, we got a family coming in uh, uh, on the 31st. That's, Chris, that's Easter. He said that's the only time he's going back to Papua New Guinea. So uh, I met his wife and him down at... Uh, Jacksonville uh, is a nice guy, real nice guy. Wife's a, a phenomenal uh, musician. I mean, she sang beautiful. I mean, great. Uh, I was talking to him, and he goes, he goes, brother. I said, brother. I said, uh, we're going to take you on no matter what. Uh, I said, so if if something happens, you can't come. Don't worry about it. We're still going to take you on. He goes, that's a blessing. I said, and he goes, I said, it's because your wife sings so well. And he goes, he goes, you wouldn't believe how many people tell me that, man. And we were just laughing back and forth. Most, he said, most preachers tell me, look, brother, you just shut up, let your wife sing, we're done, okay, you're in. Uh, so, I mean, she was really, it was a blessing, and I got to meet him, talk to him for a few minutes, and a real humble guy, seemed like a really nice guy. When I told him, him and Joe know each other very, very well, I didn't know that at all. Uh, when I told him, he was just talking about you the other day with somebody else, and uh, so he was right on the, I think it was good, too, but <laughs> I think it was positive, I think it was. First Thessalonians. So right here it says, the desire, the sincere milk of the word, that ye may grow thereby. So the Lord wants you to grow, and you're going to grow. If I could have known at 66, if I could have known at 22 what I know now at 66, how my life would be totally different. All the things I thought at 22 and 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22 are, are childish, are baby stuff. Compared to what I know at 66, I, I enjoy listening to older preachers. I, I like going back and listening to them, even some of them that are yelling, screaming at you and all of this stuff. I don't mind that uh, because there's some wisdom in those men's life. Ladies, I like going to talk to old ladies sometimes. Just sit there and listen to them. There's some wisdom in, in their lives because they've lived. There's hurt, there's pain, there's happiness, there's joy, mountaintops, valleys, all this stuff. But a lifetime of that stuff that they got through, and the will of God's the same thing. 
The will of God is one of those things where you may think you know the will of God. Uh, I would I'd watch what you say with your mouth. Because when you throw that thing out, then what you just did is you told everybody that you know something. And if it don't work out that way, then you're going to have to eat crow and say, I don't know what it is or I thought what it is. And what you'll find is your emotions and your, fle your, your flesh will get involved. Now, brethren, this is, this is 66 years of watching this stuff. Actually, I'll give, my, I'll give you 50. Uh, the first uh, 16 years, I probably didn't know a whole bunch of anything. But I've watched the flesh and what people do with the flesh, and it'll, it'll drive you to do some of the stupidest things. And then, guess what? you got to learn to live through it. There's the blessing of the whole thing. It's called growing by grace. When, when your life, when you mess up, there's nothing wrong. Here you go, watch this. There's nothing wrong with messing up. I wish nobody did, but there's nothing wrong with it. You know what it is? It's a place to grow. Because all of a sudden you go, man, man, oh, I blew it there. The hardest thing you'll ever do is to be around people. You, may, you ought to be on a ship in the Navy and blow it and have to go back to work the next day and work with them people all day long. And, and how about if you're their boss and you blow it? You know what you learn to do? Be very cautious before you blow it. If you're going to blow it, make sure you know exactly what you're going to do and you take responsibility for it because the whole, everybody's watching you. And then you got to live through that. And when you come out on the other side, guess what? You're a better person for it. I thank God for everything. I, man, I, I've done some stupid things when I was a young person. Uh, I didn't know better. I just didn't know better, but I did some stupid things. You can run from it or live with it. And if you live with it and go on through it and quit stinking running and grow up, then guess what you'll do? You'll get someplace where God can use you. Thessalonians is a book to the baby Christians. It's a book to help you get some basic doctrine down so you can get some stuff down. It said, guess what we're waiting for right now, the second coming of Christ. You know what's all through 1st and 2nd Thessalonians? Second coming of Christ. It's all there. A, a baby Christian can get that. Oh, man, hey, uh, I was lost. I know I'm saved. Yeah, it's, a, it's a blessing. I, can't, I, couldn't, I still remember when Rolf told me I was saved. I didn't know what the word saved meant. Man, I'm like, saved? Us Catholic, man, what's saved? We're not saved. We got to endure to the end and then have our last rites and all that other stuff. And just maybe if we go to purgatory for 100 million years, we'll get into heaven. That's, that's what you're taught. When you get in your Bible, you'll find words like saved. The atonement of Jesus Christ. He atoned for my sins. And, he, and I got saved by the blood of Jesus Christ. Man, that stuff's great. Uh, since the second coming of Christ is the main theme of the entire Old Testament. So when you're reading your whole Old Testament, guess what it's all talking about? It's Christ coming. Christ coming. The Jews, why did he pick Abraham? So that Jesus Christ could come into the world. It wasn't that Abraham was just somebody to be picked, back there to be picked. No, it was just, hey, i got to bring my son into the world at, at 4,000, between 4,000 4, and 5,000 B.C. i got to bring Jesus into the world. My, my, i got to come into the world. Who am I going to use to bring that bloodline down through to get to that point where I can come into the world? That was Abraham. Abraham did some things. And God used him. God will use you the same way. There's not a person in this room that the Lord Jesus Christ can't use. If you will let him. But the problem is, is we get arrogant and pride. That Only by pride. You're, you're very, if you don't memorize any verses, or you ought to read two. Memorize two. Jesus wept. That's an easy one. Gets you out of a lot of trouble when somebody says, give me a verse. Jesus wept. And only by pride cometh contention. If you have a problem with somebody else, pride is the problem. And either you have it, and they have it, or just you have it, or just they have it. Chances are both of you got it, but in any case, only pride is where the problem lies. A Christian, and that's what we're going to learn about some of this stuff, you're going to start having to put that stuff aside and get it out of your life so that you can grow in the grace and knowledge of our, as a newborn babe, a newborn babe cannot deal, you know, a new baby, uh, uh, Riley the other day, Elizabeth always tells me, I cannot give her any candy. Why, I don't know. I mean, she's depriving that little girl, but that's Okay. It's her baby, and they know it's baby, and they can do whatever they want, but I'll still sneak it in there somehow. Uh, but so somebody left back here on the table. They left a bag of gummy bears, and I got gummies now, so all the kids are going to get gummies, and if you don't want your kids to have gummies, just let them get them and then take them away from them. You be the ogre, not me. Uh, but anyway, she grabbed this little bag, and she's chowed down on these things, and she comes around the corner, and Elizabeth sends her right down to me, so I can see her with the bag of gummies. And I, I couldn't believe it. I'm like, I can't believe it. And I said, Elizabeth, you like, she was, no, she stole it off the table back there. So all, all men are liars. So that just goes to prove thieves and everything else. They started at a very young age. 
And, uh, and I, I said, I said uh, and I gave the gummies out. So I said, Riley, can I have one? And usually I can't understand baby talk. I need somebody to interpret for me. She goes, no, they're mine. I mean, just as clear as, as either I just understood baby talk or that girl knew exactly what she was saying. Uh, and, you know, that's just, that's just, that's just, that, <laughs> I mean, it's like, well, she gets deprived of that stuff in her whole life by Elizabeth, so it's only fair. But anyways, back to this. So the second coming of Christ is the main thing in the Old, Old Testament. More than 5,000 or 500 verses back there, all, all to the second coming of Christ. A new convert should naturally get into 2 Thessalonians to read further, uh, further about the essential biblical doctrines, and you go on down through there. So I'm not going to go through everything. I don't want to really get through all that stuff. But what I wanted to say basically is that Thessalonians really is the first New Testament book that Paul wrote. It was written in, if you go to the book of Acts, it was written between 16, Acts 16 and 17. That's where Paul started writing. That's where he gets out there and starts doing this stuff. So God starts using him. Yeah, here you go. Have you ever thought about the men? There's, a, there's just a select group of men that wrote your Bible. And those out of the billions and billions of people on the planet, there's a select group of men that God chose to write your Bible. You can either be thankful or angry because you weren't one of them. Uh, I'm, I'm thankful. I'm thankful that he did not give me that. I tell him all the time, I said, Lord, boy, I'm sure glad you did not give me. There's things going on in the world right now in our body, in the body of Christ, that when you sit there and look at it, boy, I'm glad you didn't give me the ability or give me the opening to get into some places like that to mess it up. You never gave me, you never gave me stuff too bad to mess things up, and I'm, I'm okay with that. And I'm, I'm, I'm like, hey, man, don't just... Just don't give me something that I'm going to mess it up. I'm thankful that I don't have a church of 10,000 or 5,000 or 400. I'm thankful for that because I'm afraid I would mess the thing up. And the Lord, I, sometimes I'm thankful. I said, Lord, you know, you may not let me be, do some of this stuff because you're keeping me from, out of trouble. And I'm thankful for that. Some people get, get upset because, oh, well, God's not using me. Well, maybe if he did, you'd mess up and mess up a whole bunch of other people's lives. You know, that's why he tells you to learn as newborn babes. So you go on. So Thess First Thessalonians is written about 50, 52, something like that. The word Thessalonians means hot springs, which who really cares? Uh, the first epistle uh, has five chapters, 89 verses, and was written somewhere. And I, I, I gave the, verse, uh, the time frame there. Thessalonica was originally called the uh, Therms. Uh, Rome made it the, the capital of Macedonia in 6 164 B.C., uh, 164 years before Christ, and built a great highway through it. When Paul writes to the Christians there, Acts 17, 16, 17, uh, they are undergoing persecution, uh, and you get that in 2 Thessalonians 1, 4. So the body of Christ is always having issues. Proverbs 35 says this, every word of God is pure. Go back and look at that. You ever read your Bible? You ought to read your Proverbs today. You should have read this yesterday. If you read your Proverbs, one proverb a day, it's good for you. Uh, you have to force yourself to do it. Reading your Bible is not something easy to do. Uh, some people can naturally do it, I guess. Uh, I have never been one of those people that can naturally do it. Uh, so I have to force myself. I have to force myself until I sit down and start reading my Bible. Uh, I'll find a thousand reasons not to read it. Read it. But I'll have to force myself to read it. Proverbs 30. And you read your Proverbs every day. And guess what, man? It'll actually change your life. Listen to this. Every word, verse 5, every word of God is pure, and it is. He is a shield unto them that put their trust in him. How do you put your trust in him? By reading his word. There's no other way to do it. Uh, you don't just arbitrarily go, oh, I think I'll trust God. No, you read this thing, and your mind sits there and looks at it, and you start reasoning. But come now, let us reason together. The Lord's always talking to us. If, if, you, are, if you are doing something stupid... Hey, man, when I was a kid, you know what I did? Stupid stuff. I sold drugs. I did drugs. That was stupid. That was stupid. It was stupid then. It's stupid now. Now it's even worse because they're, they're mingling stuff into the stuff today that will kill you dead. That wasn't the problem back when I was, was in that thing. I had guns in my face and people chasing me. That was stupid. That was foolish. But we think that, well, I, I'm, I'm invincible. I can do whatever I want. That's called foolish. It's foolish. We do foolish stuff all over the place, man. People do crazy stuff. You know why it is? They're not in the Word of God. 
So they never have the word of God to balance that thing out. And God's not going to ever make you do anything. He says, come now over in Isaiah chapter 1. He says, come now, let us reason together. He wants to talk to you. You know what drugs do? Keeps you from reasoning. You can't reason when you're on drugs. Have you ever talked to a drunk? Man, my dad used to, I mean, he was one of the best drunks I ever met in my life. I met a lot of drunks. You could not reason with him when he was drunk. You can't reason with people when they're on drugs. You can't reason with people when they're angry. You can't reason with a lot of people. You know what you got to do? Say, okay, Lord, i got to grow through some things. Some of this stuff has to go away. I have to get it out of my life. Come now, let us reason together. Say, Lord, though your sins. So he wants to deal with our sins and get it through. A baby Christian, the hardest thing, I, I've noticed some people coming into church and they can't handle it. And I either become like Joel Osteen or, or you just deal with it because they're way over here and we're way over here, and the world has got them so far into this stuff that they don't know how to live here. It's a really rough, rough thing for them. I feel sorry for them. They have to grow some to get out here to where we're at. Uh, and, and get in your Bible, knowing some things that God's done for you is a, is a great thing. The men listed in verse 1. Paul, Paul, 1 Thessalonians 1. Every word of God is pure. Hold fast that form of sound word. So he says over in 2 Timothy 1.13, Hold fast. So when you get something, that's why you're supposed to grow in grace uh, as newborn babes. You, you learn some things, and you, you start laying your foundation. You don't go over there and say, oh, I know all this stuff in Revelation. Revelation is a good thing. that You know, people still fight over that. There is Bible scholars still fighting over the book of Revelation. So knowing the book of Revelation doesn't solve your problem at all. You know what you need to do? You need to build a foundation. Other foundation have, you, you can't lay anything else other than what Jesus Christ laid. So you get that stuff done. It's like a baby sucking milk. You suck the milk down and you suck the milk down until you can eat the meat or the lettuce or whatever comes next. Uh, hold fast that form of sound words. And the, here's a good one over in John 8. He that heareth God's word, hear, he that heareth, he that is of God, heareth, God's words. Now, here's, you, go, you go anywhere and you hear people preach. And if you walk away from that thing and refuse to heed what they, and you knew that guy was a man of God or that man was preaching the word of God, you, you got the problem. The problem is you, not anybody else. You're rejecting the word of God. And they say light rejected becomes lightning. I don't know about you. I don't know how long it takes light to turn into lightning. Uh, I just never want to find out. He that is of God heareth God's words. Ye therefore hear them not, because ye are not of God. Jesus, that's Jesus Christ talking. That's not me. So a baby needs to be established on the word of God. Thessalonians, 1 Thessalonians is, is something for newborn babes. It'll get you started. It'll get you rooted and grounded. Uh, I would like everybody, I'm sure if you go to uh, uh, TBDI or PBI, I know you're going to get a PBI. Uh, I, I, I've never looked at the, uh, the, the thing that TBDI does. I know he gets into it. Uh, but Thessalonians is a great book. First one, Paul and Silvanus and Timotheus, uh, unto the church of the Thessalonians, which is in God the Father and in the Lord Jesus Christ, grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. There's a, something you really, uh, Paul is the greatest Christian in your Bible. There is, I mean, Jesus Christ is the, the author of Christianity. Paul's the greatest Christian. Uh, Paul sits here when he studies, he says, Paul and Silvanius and Timotheus. You know what Paul's doing? He's hanging around with Christians. He doesn't, you'll never see Paul, he'll go up on Mars Hill and preach at them, but you'll never see Paul hanging out with people that aren't Christians. You know what's wrong with people today? You hang out with the wrong people. Uh, you, when, you know why God used Paul? Now, here you go. It isn't that God just used Paul and Paul's going to be, he's a good, no, no, no. In the end of this thing, we all go to heaven if you're saved. Paul is, is a servant of Jesus Christ. Somebody who doesn't hang out with the right people is not a servant. You got to learn, that's a babe. You're still a babe. You're still a whiny crybaby. You need your diapers changed. Why? Because you're not doing what the, you never learned. And maybe you just never learned. And maybe you need to learn that, that when I got saved, why did you get saved? Well, I didn't want to go to hell. Why? Why would you care? And if you did get saved so you wouldn't go to hell, don't you think the one that saved you from going to hell might want you to be in heaven? Have you thought about trying to figure out what heaven's like? And if that's my destination, if hell was one side or, and heaven's the other, and I changed, why did I change? And if I changed... 
don't you think I should be trying to serve him somehow in my life? I mean, you would just think that would be common sense. But, but the devil's got us all, man, I tell you what, this, this race stuff, this, this, uh, oh, it, it is all crazy. Uh, they want to, I heard somewhere, there was some, some, I guess in Senate somewhere, is a, uh, an Arab woman that is all for Somalia, Somaliland. And she's over here saying, We're for the, I'm for the Somaliland. And the Ethiopians, has nothing to do with America. She's done put America on the back burner. They want to kick her out of the country. I'm like, our, we're, our country's crazy, man. You start looking at all that stuff, and I'm like, this is hilarious. I mean, it, to me, it's hilarious. I can see the hand of God in every bit of that, and I'm like, Lord, I don't have to worry about a thing. Paul, I want to hang around. I want to hang around people that want to hang around Jesus. And if you don't want to hang around Jesus, I don't want to hang around you. If you got something you want to do in the world, go do it, man. Leave me alone. Just, I want to find the people that want to hang with Jesus, and I want to hang with him. That's what I want. And when I finish my life and I take my, I heard uh, uh, Miss, Miss Hustle showed me a picture of a guy passing away the other day. And uh, when he went out here, I thought, man, that's the greatest thing I've ever seen in my life. They took a tractor, a tractor trailer, took the trailer off. They, they put, they built a wood thing on the back of the trailer or the tractor where you'd hook the trailer up to it. And they placed his coffin on that and they drove him to the funeral, funeral grave site on the back of a semi-tractor trailer, well, a tractor. And, uh, you know, typically everybody throws you in a hearse and down you go. And I'm like, you know, hey, this guy's headed out of here. He wants everybody to see I'm gone, man. I'm on the back of a track. Who cares? Who cares? But this is the last thing I want. And they all put him up on it and lift him up there and shot him down there. I thought, well, Lord, what a blessing, man. Here's somebody who doesn't really even care about that body no more. It doesn't. Wow, I'm going on to someplace else. I'm, I'm headed out of here. I'm going to someplace else. I'm going to go see the Lord. Paul and, and, and Silvanus and Timotheus under the church of the Thessalonians. So Paul's writing a letter to these men. The men in verse 1 are Paul's friends. Uh, those whom he would call fellow laborers over in Philippians uh, 4, 3, and fellow soldiers in uh, Philippians 2, 5. Silvanus is also Silas in Acts. So uh, when you get over in the book of Acts and you read Silas, that's, that's Silvanus right there. But Paul is calls these are his fellow laborers and fellow soldiers. Uh, that's what we should be, soldiers. You're, you're in the Army. Uh, you're in the Army now. I'm, I was in the Navy, but the Navy is a branch of God's Army. Uh, everything is about the Army when you get in the Lord's Army. You want to be in the Lord's Army. The Lord's Army has all kinds of people in it. It has people who do the supply chains. It has people who sit behind desks someplace and, and do this and do this and make sure that all the ships out there or the, the Army, the guys got their tents and they got everything they need to fight the battle. That's exactly what the Army does. Uh, it is a group of body of believers that are forced... Aquila and Priscilla helped everything. Uh, Jesus Christ, uh, Mary, there was about three or four Marys and, and Salome and a whole bunch of ladies that supplied Jesus Christ with the needs he had while he was here on the earth. The army, the army isn't just this. The army is serving Jesus Christ. As a babe in Christ, the very first thing you should ever realize is that you're, you have become a servant of Jesus Christ. You were a servant to the world. And, and you need to let that thing go. You're now a servant of Jesus Christ. But this thing over here is hard to let go of, man. I'm telling you, this thing is a, is a rough thing to let go of. But this is a, is a no-end job. This is a no-end in, in, in product. Uh, the salutation is clear to anyone. Uh, when you get into that, it says, uh, which is of God, which is in God the Father and in the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace be to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, there is no difference between Jesus Christ and God the Father and the Holy Spirit. They're all the same. These three are one. They all have three different distinct personalities, but in the end of that thing, they're all in all. They're one. They're one. Uh, I don't completely understand the Trinity. I don't think I'll ever understand the Trinity. I, I keep seeing Jesus as a distinct person because he's the one who God manifests. Well, i got a couple of verses here. Paul <clears throat> an apostle of Jesus Christ by the commandment of God, our Savior, over in 1 Timothy 1.1, 1, 1, and the Lord Jesus Christ, which is our hope. 1 Timothy 3.16, he says this. He says, and without controversy, great is the mystery. It's a mystery. If it wasn't a mystery, he wouldn't have said it. Paul said this, mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh. So there's, there's scholars, and, and here you go. Trying to get all scholastic in this thing is, is okay, if you got your foundation where it needs to be. But the problem with a lot of people is they want this stuff out here way before they get this here. So they fail here. 
They tell, I know all kinds of people who want to show me how great, that, how much stuff they know. And you look at their lives, and their lives don't match the Bible any way, shape, form, or fashion. And guess what? People are looking at us. And they're, they're looking at you to see what you are. They can tell what you are in a heartbeat. Uh, in in second, 1 Timothy only 3.16 says, and without controversy, 1 first, first Timothy 3.16, without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen of angels, preached unto the Gentiles, believed on in the word, received up in the glory. Isaiah 44, 6, Old Testament passage. Thus saith the Lord, King, the King of Israel. Guess what Jesus is called in, in Revelation when he comes back down on his horse? King of kings and Lord of lords. That's him. Uh, Thus saith the Lord, the King of Israel, and his Redeemer, the Lord of hosts. I am the first, I am the last, and besides me there is no God. There is none. They, everybody, what, whatever this world serves, it doesn't exist. God says, I'm telling you, it don't exist. And you're going to be sadly mistaken and upset one day when you take your last breath and stand before me when you didn't have to do that. Well, it, the, the Christians that get their foundation where it belongs grow over the years. And guess what? You learn how to start taking stuff that doesn't really go your way. Uh, I mean, if, if you think everything is going to, I get saved, and it's just going to be this mountain climb until the Lord takes me out here and I go to heaven. That's not Christianity. It never was. Well, it's not the one I've ever seen. I've seen all kinds of people have to put up with all kinds of stuff over the years, good things and bad. I mean, it's just, it goes both ways. But you, what I've learned is over the years, you learn how to get through it. And you keep learning, and you keep learning, and you learn what your responsibilities are to the Lord. And, and then you start doing that. Then you start becoming the servant you should be. And you can let some of this other stuff go off to the wayside. But, the, but identifying, identifying the problem right off the bat is that we're not what we're supposed to be. And I'm not acting like I'm supposed to be. That's where Thessalonians put you. Uh, Paul says this right here in Isaiah well, 46. He says, uh, actually, 1 John 5, 6 says this. This is he that came by the water and the blood, even Jesus Christ, not by water only, but by the water and blood. And it is the spirit that beareth uh, uh, witness because the spirit is truth. For there is three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. And these three are one. So when Paul is sitting here talking about Jesus Christ, he said, hey, guys, the first thing you need to understand that this world don't have is Jesus Christ is God, manifest in flesh. He is, he is born again. He, oh, born again. He wasn't born again. He died on the cross. He, he rose. He lived 33 years, died on the cross, rose again the third day. He's sitting in heaven right now. He is God. Manifest, he was God manifest in the flesh for you. And what you do is you start building that foundation. You say, okay, this is what our Bible teaches. This is what the Word of God teaches. And since it teaches this, I'm going to hold on to that. I'm not going to let the Word have it. Verse 2, we give thanks to God always for you all. Now, Paul's talking to a bunch of baby Christians. First letter he wrote to the, the anybody was this one right here. We give thanks to God always for you all, making mention of you in our prayers. The we is Paul, Silvanus, and Timothy. I mean, he's hanging with Christians. Let me ask you a question. Who, who's your best friends? Who are you hanging with? Because who you hang with is what you'll become. Uh, an old preacher told me and Joe one time, birds of a feather flock together. Well, me and Joe's been around each other for quite a while, and I, I, I'm okay with that. I'm okay with that. I mean, I, I know what Brother Joe thinks, and I know what I think. Do we always agree? No, we don't. But I know he loves the Lord, and I love the Lord. I got a lot of you guys in here. I, I don't mind hanging around with you. Uh, Mike and Brian, <laughs> we work over there, brother. You got to, I mean, you got to, uh, it's a workplace, so it's okay. <laughs> but it's still, I got two brothers over there, man, that we, we have a good time. And they're trying to reach other people, and you, all day long you, you see them trying to. That's who I want to hang with. I don't know about you. Now, I had to go out into the world. I got that. I had to work with people in the world. I got that. But I can still be the Christian I need to be. But if you don't have a very strong foundation, you won't be what you're supposed to be in that world. And that's, that's what you do. You're starting to develop that. I, well, I want to be like Jesus. Do you really? I do. People say, well, I know what the will of God is. <laughs> How could you possibly know what the will of God is if you don't have a walk with Jesus Christ? I mean, a strong walk. You, how could you, you can know some basic things, but, but, but I'm telling you what, when you start looking at a lot of things in the Bible, 
uh, you'll find out that you fall short. I fall short. I read mine. I tell you, I read it four times a year. I fall short. I read that thing. I'm like, Lord, I am falling short of all of this. And I just got through Leviticus today, and I am tickled pink that I don't have to do that stuff. Yeah. I don't know about you, but I'm telling you what, man. I, I st- he, Jesus Christ gets better and better and better to me every single day. We give thanks. Paul, Paul is giving thanks for those in Thessalonica. When was the last time you gave thanks for somebody that you're working with? When is the last time you give thanks? You know what he said, guys in Thessalonica? He said, I'm happy. I'm, thank- I'm thanking God for you guys. Always praying. Now, not 24-7, but he is praying for them. Do you pray for those around you? You know what's wrong? The world will take your time. you got to stop that stuff and start praying, doing the thing, be thankful and praying, thankful and praying. And what you'll do is you start backing away from this world a little bit at a time, and all of a sudden you get back here away and, and you start doing I heard a preacher the other day, uh, he was saying, look, if you're going to pray, pray, pray a minute a day. Don't try to go out and pray for three hours on your knees for, uh, and fall asleep and everything else. We used to pray down at PBI. They had a place over the platform or back there in a the room. Uh, they still got that? Yeah, and people would go over and pray. You hear, you hear everybody having a storm. <laughs> and, you know, you get up there and lay flat in a dark area, man. I mean, that's what you do, man. You go to sleep. Uh, <laughs> Pete, I did it. I did it. Uh, Peter did it. Peter, Jesus came back. The Son of God walked up and caught him sn- snoring, man. I mean, all of them. So it's just one of those things. So don't try to pray for five hours at a time. Get down on your knees and say, Lord, thank you for this morning. And and if that's all you can do, then get up and go on. Maybe tomorrow you can say thank you for this morning and thank you for yesterday too, man. Yesterday turned out pretty good. And what you'll do is you'll find out as time goes on. You know, if you lost people say they're overweight, I'm overweight again. One pound a week in 52 weeks is 52 pounds. That's a lot of weight. One pound a week. I'm going to lose five pounds a week. Why? I didn't put it on five pounds. Well, I probably did. But, but, but one pound a week will do it, man. A half a pound a week in two years is 50. I mean, anybody lose 50 pounds, man, you'd be tickled pink. So just prayer. Paul's sitting there saying he's praying. You know what he's doing? Him and Timothy and Sylvanus are praying. Paul is definitely praying for these people. He wants to see them get right. He wants to see them do right. He wants to see them grow. Just like That's why God gave him the book that he, he wrote. We, we have his writings, remembering without ceasing. So Paul is never forgetting what the Thessalonians have. He says, remember without ceasing your work of faith, labor of love, and, and patience of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ in the sight of God and our Father. The Thessalonian converts were noted for three things. They were noted for three things in their lives. Let me ask you a question. What are you noted for? If somebody come up and said, you, Mike, or this. I had somebody come through the door back here at a funeral one day. Actually, a couple times. Done the same thing. Says, Mike, you're the same as you were way back when. You haven't changed a bit. They could have said you're older and fatter, but they didn't say that they were gracious. But they said you are the same as you were 30 years ago. That's a, te- that's a, that's a compliment. I think. It could have been. I didn't change. Well, maybe I was wrong three years ago, and I'm still hard-headed. No, I understood exactly what they were saying. You're doing the same thing today that you're doing, but a little different. You're further down the line. Guess what? 30 years ago, I wasn't a pastor of a church. But 30 years ago, I was still telling people about Jesus Christ. 30 years ago, I still had street preaching. 30 years ago, I still hung out with Christians. 30 years ago, I still did the same thing I did now, but in a different place than I was 30 years ago. Where will you be in 30 years? It's coming, and it's coming quicker than you think. And I've run across all kinds of people in my, 30, in my short 40, 43 years of Christian walking that give you the impression they're one thing, and all you have to do is look. You see, if you, emotions are hard. I'm telling you, emotions are hard. you got to get that thing. I've been through that stuff, man. I had nine years of misery. But I knew, I knew, I knew I didn't know. That's what I knew. Because if I knew, there wouldn't be any question. And if there's a question, that means I don't know. And if I don't know, then I only know one person who knows, and that's God. And I'm just going to stop and wait. I waited nine years. I waited a good seven. And, and, And then all of a sudden, it started clicking, and I could say, I know exactly what God said. I know in my life, I could, probably let, I could probably name you five, six, maybe seven times 
in 43 years that I knew what the will of God was. Just, I mean, absolutely, positively, beyond a shadow of a doubt, I knew what the will of God was. All the other times you get the will of God and then you live until you finish what he tells you to finish. God, he doesn't repent on what he says. If he told you to do something, he's not going to tell you to do something else until you do what he told you to do. Then he's going to come back and tell you something else. That'll be another revelation to the will of God of your life. Everybody says, oh, I could do, and then, no, I won't do this, but I'll go find, that, that you're deceiving yourself. That's a baby talking. God shows you exactly what to do, and if you can grasp what he said to do, I don't think of 14, 15, there's a couple, there's a couple. There's always an exception to the rule. Typically in this world today, somebody that young cannot know the will of God. I don't think they can know it. If they do, they're, like I said, they're exceptions to the rule. I'll give them that. But it's very dangerous. I mean, you need to make sure. I've had, I've had preachers come up and say, well, Mike, you're this. And I'm like, no, I don't care what you say. Uh, I, I don't have the peace of God to pass it. I, I don't have the distinct, I don't know exactly what to do. I don't know. If I'm going to put my life out there on, on the line for Jesus Christ and, and have him judge that thing, and I'm going to say it's the will of God, I'm going to make sure I know exactly. I, I'm going to make sure I heard God say it. Not some stinking cell phone. The Lord say it. I want him to say it. Not some preacher. I want him to say it. And I want him to imprint that thing in my mind so hard that when he gets done and he walks away, I want to be like Noah and go build an ark. You know how you can tell somebody if they know the will of God? They'll do something. And, and sometimes they'll get something, and it'll be 20 years before the Lord tells them to do something else. And then he'll tell you what to do after you finish what he tells you to do. I'm still afraid he's going to send me to Zimbabwe. So we're going to, we're going to make that apartment last forever over there. <laughs> but, but the Thessalonians had, they, they had three things known for what they were. The world knew that. Uh, the Thessalonians converts were noted for three things. Uh, number one is that they did it out of the right motive, love. Remembering without ceasing your work of faith and labor of love. When you do something... If it's the will of God for you to do it, it'll be out of love. It won't be out of filthy lucre's sake. You know what's wrong with most people? They hear the word tithing. This is baby stuff, man. This is, this is, like, this is like milk and crackers, a bottle of milk, man. That's what this is, tithing. When it comes to tithing, you know what you hear? Money. If you really cared and it was a labor of love, you'd use every, every aspect of your life to get something done for Jesus Christ. If he allowed something to come in and out of your life, you would use that thing for his honor and glory no matter what. Now, I'm not saying you can't have a house. I got a house. I'm not saying you can't have a car. You can have a car. I don't care what you got. I'm just telling you that that thing is, a, they had a labor of love. They were known for that. They gave and gave and gave and gave and gave and gave. They loved doing stuff. They worked. They did all kinds of stuff. It's a labor of love. He goes to number two, he goes, the Thessalon uh, remembering without ceasing your work of faith. It was a faithful work. It was all by the nature that they did was by, by the work. And it was a right motive. The motive was love. They loved, it was the love of Jesus Christ and the love of God's people. They tried to help them do whatever they could. And they were patient. Verse, verse two there says, and patient of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. They had the right foundation, the right foundational thing. They, their foundation was built on Jesus Christ, and they were starting to grow there. And Paul used them at the, at the initial thing in his ministry to show everybody, look, if, if you're going to use, here's an example of some people that you want to use as your an example. Is my foundation exactly where it should be? Brother, we're going to get into a world that's going to be harder and harder and harder to live. And if you're not settled on that foundation, you can't, it's going to be rough to make it. And you're always going to be drugged by somebody else. If somebody has to drag you to church, there's something wrong with you. You don't have to drag me to church. Well, Beth has to drag me sometimes. Uh, I mean, I get tired. I'm getting old and, and cranky and tired. And I think I just ought to make me a room upstairs in the back back there somewhere so I don't have to go too far. I can just come right to church. But if somebody has to make you go to church, I bet you they don't have to make you go to a Taylor Swift concert. <laughs> I hope none of you go to a Taylor Swift concert. If you do, please do not tell me you go to a Taylor Swift concert. 
Uh, I mean, there's, there's all kinds of things where you, you could say, well, I can do this and I do this. And, and, and you have to be drugged to church. Something's wrong. Something's wrong with the picture. Uh, he goes, and they, and they were patiently waiting for the Lord and Savior's to return. Down in verse 10, look at 10 real quick, and I, I'll stop right here. That way we can get into prayer. Verse 10, and to wait for his son. So Paul's sitting there talking to him. Actually, go to verse 9. For they themselves show of us what manner of entering in we had unto you. Thessalonians, you guys are showing the world what kind, of, what kind of testimony or what kind of work we did in your lives and how it took faith, how it took into your life. He goes, how you turned to God from idols, and they were serving idols. So God's never, the Lord's never asking you to do anything more than he did as other people. And some of these people were raised in this idol worship stuff. They were, they were born in it. They were raised in it. And when they took, you know, a Jew is the strangest thing, and Muslims are the same way. You're raised and, and you become a Christian, you are ostracized. I mean, you, the Jews just hate you. The Muslims kill you if they get their hands on you. And you sitting there looking at it. We were never asked that. I was raised Catholic. I was never asked that. But these people here were raised when Paul went up on Mars Hill and he got up on Mars Hill and he's seen they had statues for everything that you could possibly have going up that hill except one, to the unknown God. Paul goes, man, hey, I can preach that. He goes, I'll tell you who that unknown one is. You got all these and you're trying to uh, cover all the bases. You don't have to cover all the bases. The problem is, is you're not covering any of them. Paul says, I got it. He goes, and they, verse 3 it says, and they were patient. Uh, verse 3 says, and patient of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ in the sight of God and, and our Father. Verse 10, actually the, the end of 9 says, how ye turn to God from idols to serve the living and true God and to wait patiently wait for his son from heaven that's him coming back and getting you now you'll either go to heaven through the grave and we've had a few great funerals here recently or the lord will come back and get you back get you out of here but you can a, a good a true christian learn a baby christian is just like little kids man you see him running around here i like kids running around uh wally comes up and grabs my finger all the time he wants me to go get him gummies and I, if I'm talking to adults, I say, hey, don't get mad. Uh, I've got a few minutes in this little kid's life. That's all I got. Uh, I could be mean and say no. I could say you ain't going to get nothing. And that little kid is going to walk away, and the rest of his life he's going to see. I had an Uncle James, Catholic. You know what I knew about James? My Uncle James always brought me candy. That's probably why I'm fat. But he always brought, brought us candy, always, always. Whenever I seen James, you could... Pair the two together. He's got a little back. Well, he owned a store up on top of Campbell, in Campbellsville, up on top of Turkey Foot, on top of the mountain there. A little country store you go in. Still had the old Coke machines with the glass tops on them. I mean, all that stuff, you know. Mountain Dew and the green bottles. I mean, real stuff, man, back in the day when it was real stuff. Jars with candy in it. When he come off that mountain, come to see us in Louisville, he always brought us candy. I don't know much about James other than that. But I never forgot it. You know, as a kid, a little kid, you got a few minutes in a little kid's life. That's all you have. And that little kid's going to grow up, and what was done to him as a child is how they're going to usually be when they're older. And the Lord's going to have to undo everything that happened to that kid. You know what we got an opportunity to do right now is to help some get through so they don't end up like that. Just because we ended up like that don't mean they have to. They don't have to do that. Verse 10, he goes on, he goes, and to wait for his son from heaven. Are you waiting? What are you waiting for today? You're in such a hurry to do everything? What are you waiting for? I'm waiting. You know what I'm waiting? I'm just waiting. You say, well, all the stuff you do around here, does it really matter? Probably not. In the big scheme of things, if he's going to burn everything up, it's all going to burn up anyways. But for the little bit of time, the limited time that I have, he gives me something to do to keep me out of trouble. And he gives me something to do to keep Mike and Brian out of trouble. And we try to keep uh, Brother Rich out of trouble, but... He comes in and stirs it. He told me today, I said, Rich, I need you to come in every now and then and help us out, man. I said, I'm, like, I'm, in, the, I'm in the pot with the stew here. And, and I said, and, and I'm not having much effect. He goes, well, I'm just here to stir it up, man. <laughs> I'm like, you ain't no help to me. <laughs> no, he is. But you know what? You sit there and I'm like, Lord, what could I be doing out there to get in trouble? What else could there? People say, oh, you're waiting. No, no, I could, there's other things I could be doing to cause trouble. And I think, I'm, I'm thankful. I said, okay, Lord, I'm just settle down. Look at what's in front of you. Patiently, he says, and to wait for his son from heaven, 
whom he raised from the dead. That can only be Jesus. If you didn't know that, it says, even Jesus, which delivered us from the wrath to come. Now, whether you realize it or not, there's a day of wrath coming. And you were headed right for it. And when you trusted Jesus Christ, he got you out of that, man. The wrath. I don't think I'm going into the tribulation. I, don't, I, I would be out of place there. I think there's going to be a rapture. So I'll either go through the grave and a casket will take me out of here one day or he'll rapture me out of here and I'll be gone. I don't have to worry about that day coming, but he got me out of that. Yeah. You know what? A lot of we don't sit down and just remember that stuff and be thankful. Boy, man, I don't go. To, I wake up in the morning and say, man, I'm not going to hell today. I got to go to work, but I'm not going to go to hell. Amen. I mean, there's a lot of things I got to do, but I got to. It's not hell. Hell's not one of them. And you can sit there with a smile on your face. You know what the world started doing? They started looking at the people of Thessalonica and said, what's wrong with them people? They're different. You know what they look at us today? And they see they should see something different in us. Each one of us are different. You're all, we're all going to be different. I mean, no matter what you do in life, you're just going to be different than everybody else. You're not going to have the same things happen to you. You're not going to have the same abilities. Like I said, I don't write books. Here's... Uh, 26 books, 27 books written in your New Testament, and you don't have a book of Mike. You'll never have a book of Mike. And even if the Lord says we can add new books to the bike Bible, you won't have a book of Mike. I'm going to tell you that right now unless somebody else writes it. But I'm not going to write it. You know what I thank God for? That God used some men and gave them the ability to read and write and translate and do what they did and listen to God. That last part of that verse, I'm done. In the sight of of God and our Father. Do you know that what you do is in the sight of God? He's watching everything you're doing. And the Thessalonians, they had it in their heart that what they did was a love, it was a, a, a work of faith, a labor of love, and they patiently waited. Why? Because they knew who they were doing it for. They weren't doing it for Paul. They, they got a hold of Jesus Christ and let that thing grow. Most Christians never get to the place in their life where they just slow down and let the Lord guide and direct their steps because they're in such a hurry. Why are you in a hurry? What's the hurry? Life is going to come and go no matter what. What's the hurry? There's no hurry. You know what I'd rather do? I'd rather make sure beyond a shadow of a doubt that I know what God wants me to do. People ask me all the time, how in the world did you get a church started? And, and if you'd have been in my ordination, this would never have happened. It would have never happened. I mean, I, I blew it, man. I blew it big time. Brother Joe did a great job. I blew it. Uh, I'm telling you, man, it just it would not happen. But Lord, don't look at that. See, he doesn't look at how smart you are or how big you are or how small you are. He looks at the size of your heart. And when he looks at that thing right there, he looks at little David, man, and says, hey, David. So his dad didn't even recognize him. His brothers, none of them recognized him. Samuel's sitting there going, is this it? you got to be joking me. This is it? Well, you know, i got this little scrawny punk out here, man. He's taking care of the sheep, but, but uh, go get him. And that was the one. You know what David's heart, David's heart was ten times? He's like the Grinch, man. His heart done got this big. And David's out there doing exactly what his father said. And his father blessed him. And saw Samuel bless him, and now you got all the all the stuff that David did in your and the story of Goliath and all the stuff David did, and you got the bloodline of Jesus Christ being protected all the way down through there. And one day Jesus comes out of that bloodline, and what the Lord is looking for is some people like the Thessalonians who will who will get that stuff down. First of all, hang out with the right people, and do the right thing. Learn to do the right thing and settle that. And then move on to other things. Father, thank you for your blessings. Bless the prayer service. We'll praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Oh, there was.